He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and also uh, the uh, American Agricultural Economics Association Distinguished Fellow. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Phil join us today. And uh, my eyes are failing me, but I'll, I'll try and read the, the, the uh, uh, six-point print I've got here. Um, the title is Enabling Food and Agricultural Innovation in an Increasingly Proprietary um, and uh, um, a uh, Private Data World. So, uh, Phil... It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So I, uh, speaking here in Saskatoon, I come from your southern balmy climes of uh, Minnesota, uh, but you can probably guess that this is not a Norwegian bachelor farm accent, uh, so I hail from a little bit further south than that. Uh, I come from a, a wine-growing area south of Adelaide in Australia. My talk is going to be directly on the, the title for a change, uh, uh, and so uh, I'm going to sort of reveal uh, uh, the motivations of work we've been uh, have, uh, doing at the University of Minnesota over the last few years and, uh, and are coming to fruition. Uh, and uh, it's uh, great to have the opportunity to come and present this here uh, in Saskatoon. So I guess we can... So before getting into the data per se, I wanted to sort of step back a little bit and give uh, my a partial take uh, on a rapidly changing landscape for food and agriculture and food and agricultural R&D, which I think uh, should uh, be driving our uh, uh, approaches to, to thinking about incentivising and facilitating innovation through data. Um, uh, for many, many years I've been tracking investments in global food and agriculture R&D and so I lead here uh, with the country that is now the largest investor in food and agricultural research on the planet. So these data haven't been published yet, they're in review. Uh, so I've been working with colleagues for some years putting these numbers together. Uh, and our estimates are that China is now, uh, now being in 2013, spending just over $15 billion. And you may be surprised by that split between public and private there. Uh, this has all happened in the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, it's, uh, private uh, uh, in China includes state-owned enterprises, but there's a lot of private for-profit activity uh, uh, in that red part of that uh, pie. Uh, and so they're now outspending the US um, uh, by a substantial amount. Uh, and in fact, if you glum Brazil, India and China together, they surpassed US investments in food and ag R&D uh, over a decade ago. Uh, so the US now is, uh, for every dollar that goes into a university where I work or the USDA, there's $3 going into private food and ag R&D. So my take is in the US and for, for much of the rest of the developed world, uh, the food and agriculture R&D uh, part of the life sciences is now matching in terms of uh, the performance of research, uh, the health side of the spectrum. Uh, and I think lots of policymakers uh, are thinking of yesteryear when they think of food and ag R&D in terms of the structural presence of the private sector in that, uh, in that market. But uh, I think there's been a, a, a blending across health and uh, food and ag in terms of the performance of uh, R&D in that space. Uh, but what's true for the rich countries is not true for the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, the rest of the world in this case includes Brazil and India, uh, and they do have growing but more modest uh, private sector presence in both of those countries, um, but roughly uh, one quarter, three quarters public, uh, uh, private to public uh, in the rest of the world. So a couple of points to take out of this slide. So where in the world R&D spending has taken place has shifted big time in the last 10 to 15 years. That's not necessarily the same as where in the world innovation in food and agriculture takes place. They're related but different ideas. Uh, and who's performing that research has changed substantially. Um, where in the world agriculture takes place has changed as well. So here's a set of data where I took uh, the 180 commodities or so that the Food and Agriculture Organisation track and I summed them up in uh, uh, purchasing power parity terms and so this is a, an indication of the, the, the economic volume, if you will, or constant price value of agricultural output then, uh, being uh, half a century ago in 1961 and now being in 2014. And the good news is, in real terms, uh, the planet's uh, increased its value of agricultural output by over threefold. Uh, but if you start looking at the maps, so, so the areas uh, in these, in these uh, uh, maps indicate the regional and country shares of the respective uh, value totals. Uh, so back in the day, uh, the high-income countries collectively accounted for 44% of that total global production, and that's now shrunk precipitously uh, to 25%. 
So it's not that we've shrunk agriculture in Canada and the US and Australia and so forth, it's just that we've only grown our sector uh, by a factor of two uh, in value terms and the rest of the world's grown uh, agriculture and certainly parts of the rest of the world have grown agriculture at a much faster rate than that over the last half century. US has lost a third of its market share by value, 15% to 10%. Uh, and where's that value gone? It's flipped and gone to Asia. Uh, so uh, if you look, China alone, in value terms, is producing nearly a quarter by value of the entire world's food and agricultural output at, at farm level, pri farm gate prices. Um, so that's a huge shift. Uh, Latin America, Caribbean have also gained market share. Um, and Brazil's uh, nearly doubled its uh, um, market presence uh, in, in global agriculture. So seismic shifts between countries and regions in where in the world agriculture takes place. Uh, and I, I would predict going forward over the next 50 years, equally momentous changes in the location of agriculture. And particularly when you start getting more granular and thinking about where in a particular country a crop's grown. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of work we've been doing. Here's 100 years of data flipping through your eyes here for, uh, 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 hopefully you can tell US on one side and Brazil on the other, <clears throat> of where in those two countries corn has grown. I don't know whether we could run that again, probably not. Um, it went pretty quickly. Um, but, oh, there we go, we're running it again. So significant shift in that location of production, which has fundamental implications for thinking about genetics, by environment, by management, by socioeconomic relationships. If you're thinking about targeting innovations into an agricultural sector where the, there's huge dynamics in the spatial footprint of that se sector, uh, I think a, a lot of people are very myopic and, and don't understand that the magnitude of these changes. And it turns out if you calculate the centroid of uh, uh, corn production in both of those countries, that is the sort of geographical pivot point of where the average corn plant's grown. Uh, in the US, it's uh, picked up its corn stalks and walked uh, uh, nearly 280 kilometres west and 160 kilometres north, and it blew us away. The, the, the data for Brazil, we're still working with Embrapa on this, it's not published yet, but the magnitude of the shift there is staggering uh, in terms of opening up the Cerrados and, and moving corn in that northwesterly direction. And most of the people in the room will realise there's an incredible oddity in these data, uh, that they're both moving in a northwesterly direction, which means agroecologically they're moving opposite directions. Corn plants in the US are moving away from the equator and in Brazil they're moving towards it. So we've been selecting uh, uh, germplasm in, in Brazil uh, to achieve pretty well the same rate of gain in, in corn yields in Brazil that it somewhat dis have a disjuncture with respect to the types of germplasm we've been uh, selecting for in, in the US. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, if I remember right, Brazilian corn yields on average are about half what they are in the US, but the rates of gain have been about the same. So these are really interesting sorts of data to start thinking about uh, uh, what strategic implications that may have for innovation strategies uh, between these two countries and, and likewise elsewhere in the world. We've got similar data we've put together for a bunch of other countries, including some work we're doing in Canada here, and, and these crops move uh, big time. Uh, it turns out we did some fancy index number theory and, and decomposed what share of the output growth in US corn production over this period was due to shifting the location of crop production. I didn't know whether that number was going to be big or large, and this sort of blew me away. The, the order of magnitude here, about a fifth of the output growth was due to changing the location of that uh, crop and fundamentally changing that G by E relationship. Um, and we took 100 years of uh, spatialised clim climatological data and layered that over this shifting footprint and it turns out our estimates are the average corn plant in the, in, uh, in, uh, the US has grown in a climatology that's over a degree centigrade colder, and in Brazil it's nearly 2.4 degrees centigrade warmer. So even Mr Trump can't argue against this as being uh, human-induced climate change. This is actually shifting the footprint of agriculture and changing the climatology that hits that crop as a consequence of this movement. So to me, uh, when I think about the types of data and the types of uh, uh, implications that these big structural changes have uh, on uh, food and agricultural innovation. I think there, there's some really profound implications that we've been sort of taking on board at Minnesota and thinking about how do we reposition ourselves to take account of the fact that the US has a much more reduced market share in the R&D spending space and I don't see anything in the political tea leaves uh, that's going to turn that around or in the economic tea leaves for that matter as well. Um, and this very shifting, a radical shift in the public-private presence in this space. So we had uh, three successive revolutions uh, 
uh, during the last uh, couple of centuries, sort of mechanical, chemical and uh, biological, and we, we really are in the midst, I think, of this fourth revolution in terms of uh, the data revolution in agriculture, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's well, uh, the, the talks this morning are really exciting for me, and uh, clearly uh, this revolution is alive and well, but it's, it's very infancy, I would suggest, and uh, it's going to, to move forward in, in the years ahead. And so we heard this morning, and many of you have been to other talks, that we've just got this plethora of sensors running from uh, high sequencing uh, genomic uh, capabilities through to ground and, uh, and near ground tethered sen sensors and, and handheld sensors and uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and so forth and satellite remote sensing data. And so uh, an increasing plethora of data which is coming at us from all different formats, shapes, sizes uh, and uh, uh, capabilities on our part to, to manage this data and, and various speakers this morning reflected on this issue uh, of feeling like the sort of fire hose is open and there's lots of data flying out and how do we turn that data over into actionable information either at a science level or uh, beyond that. Um, <clears throat> and so we, we characterised uh, the issues here in sort of a 6V diagram and so a lot of people focus on this sort of volume and velocity issue that we've got a lot more data coming at us at a lot faster rate and I'd argue that there's a bunch of other aspects in here that we need to think about that get in the way between data and actionable information. And that is uh, issues related to the huge variety in the types of data that one needs to, to process to think about informing innovation processes in agriculture, which go beyond what we do in universities and so forth and go over into commercialisation. So it's not just discovery, it's uh, commercial deployment. And then increasingly we heard in uh, and a previous speaker about stewardship and thinking about uh, environmental consequences of agriculture and vice versa. Uh, there's a huge variation and lack of consistency in this data uh, and I would posit uh, there's issues about uh, veracity in a lot of these data. Uh, my experience is there's lots of numbers out there masquerading as data because uh, they're lacking uh, suitable metadata and other attributes that you could even make that data functionally usable or understand uh, with the, the quality or precision or nature of that data itself. And then as an ag economist by training, not all data has got equal value and so we uh, need to think in a much more uh, hard-nosed uh, sense about what's the sort of scientific or, or a commercial or economic value and uh, that's the, the benefit side of the story to justify the cost that we incur in uh, capturing and uh, processing and uh, managing and storing that data. Another feature uh, which is familiar to probably everyone in this room is the very siloed nature of lots of data that's sitting around the planet. So this data gets siloed uh, amongst institutions, uh, amongst individuals. We've all got data that's sitting uh, accessible just to us uh, uh, and when we retire it will be lost to, to posterity. Uh, and uh, importantly, a lot of data is, uh, is constrained with respect to subject matter discipline. Um, and when I look around and we looked in this space, there was just a lot of data that's just plain broken. Uh, it's sort of incomplete, messy, incoherent and so forth. Uh, and so to, to realise uh, the, the, the promise of this data revolution, we've got to confront some of these issues about how do we unlock the siloing of data, uh, how do we uh, appropriately uh, uh, document data and, and do that in, in a way that sort of lowers the costs of documentation so that it doesn't get in the way of data sharing and data interoperability. And so we've been putting uh, quite a bit of effort in that space over the last uh, three to four years at the University of Minnesota. And as I mentioned, given the, the nature of um, <coughs> who's doing the research, uh, we really need to, to fundamentally confront this issue about uh, data privacy. So in the US, uh, uh, there are, there's federal rules uh, related to health-related data called HIPAA, uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, and so we have lots of health-related data sitting at a public university, the University of Minnesota, which could be clinical trial data, genomic data and things of that sort. And that data is uh, unencumbered from uh, uh, public disclosure by dint of the, the HIPAA rules. Uh, it turns out there's no federal legislation with respect to any food and agricultural related data. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, dealt with that at our state legislature. We actually had a change in state statute that came into law on August the 1st of this year. Uh, which declares that data that's sitting in this agroinformatics platform that I'm going to describe to you uh, is deemed private and non-public period, so it's free from disclosure. Um, so there's a legal aspect with respect to data privacy, but there's also uh, clear technical aspects, and HIPAA lays down a set of uh, guidelines by which data is managed to be uh, compliant with those, uh, those HIPAA, uh, the HIPAA Act. 
Um, but the sorts of data that are coming in that are subject to some sort of privacy or data sensitivity issue that needs to be managed, uh, are things like uh, pharma Farmer related data, which is increasingly being generated out of precision ag and, and other sorts of uh, technologies. Uh, a whole bunch of farmer survey data, so I presume Ag Canada and uh, USDA, uh, the World Bank, the Living Standards Measurement Survey, are running around uh, surveying farmers and now increasingly uh, lat longing that data and therefore identifying exactly the location of that data. And uh, presumably here, as there is in the US, there's increasing pushback. Uh, from the farming community on both the sort of precision data and some of the survey data as to whose data is it, uh, what is my rights with that respect to that data and, and who's reaping value out of my data as a pretty familiar refrain uh, and you can sort of bury your head in the sand and ignore that but I think confronting that reality and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a fair uh, point uh, to, to, to respect the, the intellectual property that, uh, and privacy aspects that's in this data. And then increasingly, lots of corporate data, uh, lots of varietal trial data, input response data, genomic data, and things of that nature. So we looked around and saw lots of universities and others going down an open data platform, which seemed to me totally a disconnect to the realities of, how, of, of all of these sort of data privacy policies. And so we had the epiphany a few years ago of thinking about incentivizing the sharing of data, uh, uh, where we respect uh, this data privacy and IP aspects, uh, but try and unlock the data from these public and private silos, uh, which is a different idea than making data necessarily open. So I have in my career, and lots of our colleagues put lots of data into open data sources, but sharing data is a different idea than making data open. Um, so open data is a subset of sharing. And so we uh, set about uh, developing this agroinformatics platform uh, about uh, three years ago, um, and NSF, uh, 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 sorry, the National Academy of Sciences put out this report uh, this summer and uh, we were delighted to see they highlighted our platform in this uh, report. And so what this platform is about, uh, this is the sort of mission statement in a sentence. And so we're actually not about agglomerating big data uh, per se. We're actually thinking about how you can have a, a, a data platform that facilitates uh, novel sharing of that data uh, and also analytical uh, aspects to turn that data into actionable information that sort of bridges this public-private divide or the public-public divide and incentivizes new uh, public-private uh, uh, innovations in food and ag and other domain areas. And so the GEM stands for these data domain areas. So we're looking, again, we looked at a lot of big data work, particularly in the public space, was heavily focused uh, uh, in around the genomics area uh, and with some sort of phenotypic predictive work and things of that nature. But if you go and talk to companies, and, and others, uh, innovations, as I mentioned earlier, go well beyond this discovery stage to think about deployment and stewardship. And so we really need to think about sort of environmental data that's going to affect the GBIE relationship and also management, either on an experimental plot or on a farm. Uh, and, increase, and, and equally important, but often ignored, is the socioeconomic aspect of the data. So lots of companies that I talk to don't start with an innovation and look at the market, they start looking at what the market wants and sort of look back at what are, what are the technologies and, that need to be stitched together to develop the innovation portfolio that will facilitate that market, appropriate market presence. So uh, that's uh, one of the problems we started to confront is how can you make data across those four data domains functionally interoperable? And particularly, a lot of that data, as we heard this morning, comes at you with incredibly uh, diverse forms of uh, time and space dimensions. So uh, our experimental plots on our uh, uh, experiment station are being envirotyped every 30 minutes. So we've got 30 minute time steps on data at a, at a granular scale of an experimental plot. Uh, but we, you might want to be able to juxtapose that data in a functionally interoperable fashion with pixelated data uh, that might have a, a day or a week or a monthly time step and maybe a kilometer or 10 kilometer grid resolution on it and so forth. And so this platform is set out to actually spend a lot of time on the interoperability uh, of this data. Um, and pleased to report we've made a lot of progress in that regard over the last couple of years. So what does this uh, uh, platform do? Uh, it has two major elements to it. One, so one is this uh, so-called gem share component. <coughs> and what our, our little mantra is, uh, your data, your tools, your choice. And so uh, in this platform, when you uh, register or commit data into this agroinformatics platform, you, not us, gets to decide who sees that data and who uses that data and for what purpose. And so we've set up a UI 
where the, the individual or the institution or the corporation that's putting that data in, they may have a data steward or it may be just an individual scientist, uh, and you can uh, decide what community of practice. It might be just another colleague, it might be a whole uh, unit within a corporation. You might want to use it to share across different institutions, so Saskatchewan working with multiple players around the planet. Um, you get total control over that uh, uh, choice. All the data sitting in the platform is encrypted. It's encrypted in flight, so if we don't it might be sitting in the platform we're hosting, but if we don't get rights to, to look at it, um, we don't get to use it or see it. Uh, and it get, so what we're doing is making a market for this data exchange where we're not the bottleneck. So the, these uh, third parties can, can get their lawyers together and duke out a, a data use or sharing agreement, and just they themselves facilitate that data sharing in this platform. Uh, so that opens up a whole different set of uh, options that are all driven by the data owner or the data, the, the individual or firm putting the data in the platform that can go all the way from entirely open data to completely private data. Um, uh, or the more interesting part is this partner pool data where you can pull uh, not just particular data files, but you can go in and mask out attributes within those data files. So you might want to share a bunch of experimental files, but mask out uh, the, the specific genetics that's in that field or something and allow you to share that on. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about lots of flexibility for, for uh, uh, sharing data. And we recognise too, it's uh, if we're about actually actionable information, it's not just data, it's analytical tools, and linking those tools and those data together in terms of workflows. And so uh, in this platform, uh, we enable those workflows and data, the, the data and tools to, to link together in workflows. So each data point that goes into this platform uh, or data file gets a DOI, so it gets a digital object identifier. Uh, you can link that particular data to another tool which may have a DOI in it and in a workflow, and so you can uh, uh, replicate uh, the work that uh, is, uh, uh, comes as a consequence of those data and those tools. And then. We have uh, lots of other platforms out there have uh, very elegant and, and nice and useful point and click interfaces and we're developing a bunch of those ourselves but we're about innovation and so we have a so-called geek interface into this platform where you can bring in your own R code or your own scalar code or Python code or whatever uh, and do your own analytics. Uh, you can keep that private, you can share those tools, you can not share those tools. Uh, uh, it, again, it's entirely your choice. Um, we, our, our instinct, uh, like all uh, university folks, was, oh, we, we'll be able to facilitate this data sharing and we'll be able to jump into analytics. Uh, and we are enabling a bunch of analytics ourselves and, and facilitating analytic work by uh, uh, parties, third parties. Uh, but as we started to ingest uh, data from our original uh, partners, we realised uh, that there was a lot standing in the way between accessing that data and making it functionally interoperable and usable in an analytical sense. And so we've started, we've actually invested probably several million dollars into a bunch of informatic smarts uh, to try and intelligently impute uh, missing data, to enable data interoperability uh, so that we can actually then get to this enhanced uh, 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 application of advanced uh, analytical tools. And uh, the whole idea of the, the platform is to adhere to the, the FAIR principles, but to go one step beyond that and think about fairer, and that is, Reusable is not necessarily the, is not the same as reproducible. So in our platform, our, our uh, objective is to make these data uh, and tools uh, 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 present to the user in such a way that you can actually reproduce the results of the research. And as I mentioned, ethical in terms of either formal IP or informal uh, private, uh, uh, privacy or data sensitivity issues uh, are managed within the platform by the data owner, not by us. We don't make those choices. So uh, our platform is uh, sitting, so we have one of the larger uh, university-owned uh, academic supercomputers in the US. Um, I didn't realise until I started this that supercomputers were invented in the Twin Cities back in the early 60s uh, by Control Data. And uh, our engineering school played a big role in uh, supporting the development of uh, CDs, efforts and Cray research. And so the echo of that is encumbered in, uh, in the Supercomputing Institute. Uh, we've signed on a bunch of partners, so we, the University of Stellenbosch um, is a strategic partner with us, and uh, so t to the right there is our uh, key partner in Stellenbosch. Um, and the platform is extensible, so uh, uh, each one of those uh, clusters is uh, just shade under $25,000, which has got a bunch of compute and uh, uh, storage capability in it, and that, that uh, cluster is uh, federatable, so that cluster can sit anywhere in the world. 
Uh, it can sit behind a firewall in a company, uh, and uh, it allows us to, to have an international reach in this, this undertaking. But as I mentioned, uh, lots of uh, messy data, and so we set about uh, trying to help solve that problem. So we got a lot of uh, simits, uh, uh, 20 years of their breeding trial data in, uh, I don't know whether you can read that there, all sorts of spelling variations on uh, that ought to be the same, uh, and so developing a set of automated tools that smartly prompt uh, uh, the data provider to correct uh, 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 spellings so that you, when you try to then search and recover that data, you, you're actually not just getting part of the data for a particular trial, you're getting all the data relevant to that trial. Um, uh, this messy area of ontologies uh, is part of the magic of making data interoperable. Uh, so it turns out there are dozens of ontologies out there that all ha have been curated over many decades and have uh, lot, uh, so sort of uh, lots of uh, domain-specific intelligence built into the structure of these ontologies. And so we've developed a, a pretty smart mashup tool that actually doesn't invent our own ontology, but takes uh, at present eight ontologies and two data dictionaries. Uh, and when you ingest data into the platform, uh, you may be using uh, some ontologically uh, uh, approved standards or not. And if you're not, we'll prompt you uh, to say, well, you said that, but maybe you think that. Uh, and so we don't automatically re replace that, but we prompt the user uh, and try and lower the costs because none of us really, this is sort of messy metadata stuff that we want to get on and do analysis. But unless you deal with this metadata and solve this metadata problem, none of this data is going to be really functionally interoperable. And so we're, we're now actively involved uh, with the CGIR and uh, folks at UC Davis and out at Oregon State and elsewhere who are sort of leaders in particular ontology domain areas and uh, uh, um, interfacing with them uh, to implement their ontologies in this platform. Standard stuff like units of analysis, uh, sort of auto-correcting and prompting for that to make data interoperable uh, in an intelligent way is a, is a bunch of set of tools in there. Uh, an example might be more of interest to folks here. We um, have done a bunch of work uh, across various crops, uh, maize, apple, um, wheat, uh, soybeans, uh, where we were really interested in uh, pedigree relationships. Uh, and we realised as we started getting publicly accessible uh, pedigree data and data in from breeders and so forth that uh, we all know what the Purdy notation is, but uh, to, when people are out in the field, they take shortcuts and write their own abbreviations for that Purdy notation, which, which gets codified in to the pedigrees that go into the public platforms and the USDA and the like. And so our, we've got uh, 20 folks now working on the GEMS platform, all of them with dual domain expertise in uh, data science, high performance computing, and the life sciences. So we've got some really smart geneticists uh, who've reimagined the way we hold pedigree data uh, and you can see an example of some data we've been working with our soybean breeder and we've now reconstituted about 12,000 soybean pedigrees uh, that when he presented uh, a pedigree to us uh, on the, the left there, um, where we have two target uh, uh, varieties uh, with a red box and a red uh, uh, circle, uh, it had a, apparently a very shallow pedigree uh, in it. But when we sorted out uh, the problems in the notation in that pedigree, we end up with a very deep pedigree that goes all the way back to land races and fundamentally changes your understanding about the, the, the history of that variety. So we actually uh, have gone through on another project I was involved with and actually reconstructed uh, the pedigrees for all of the commercially significant wheat varieties in the US for the last 100 years. Uh, and I can tell you with a surety that the pedigrees that you get off Grin and so forth are really messy and uh, and, and uh, problematic. Uh, and so we, I, if folks are interested, I can tell you how this tool works. But it doesn't take an active brain out of it. Uh, it's an informatics-enabled uh, tool to clean up these pedigrees. And then you can start using these pedigrees in conjunction with genetic data to do some more interesting sorts of uh, predictive analytics and so forth. But unless you have uh, somewhat reliable pedigree data to start with, you're going to get a bit of nonsense out of that sort of analysis. Um, just a, a practical example of we, uh, I know folks in this room know about uh, genomes to fields. <coughs> um, so the, the land grants have had 100 plus years of uh, maize breeding and about five years ago uh, the breeders had the epiphany of let's start collaborating together, uh, easier said than done, and to their credit they got together and started harmonising their experimental protocols, uh, controls across uh, all of the states. They've even now standardised all the instrumentation they're using across uh, the land grants to try and minimise the measurement error in that regard. And uh, the long and the short of it is there's now about 23 states and 30 plus sites uh, 
that are now pooling their data uh, and uh, the GEMS platform is doing all of the informatics support to, to turn that data into to usable, uh, uh, usable asset. And here's an example of where you can incentivize this collective action because in our platform, uh, that data is held in a sense private to the pool, that is the collaborators, for two years. So they get to milk their own data and their mates' data for two years and then it becomes public data. And in our platform, that just happens with a flick of a switch. You don't have to do anything and you can segment this data in a rolling fashion over time. So we've been, uh, so being able to clean up their data collectively and make the data interoperable across all of these sites, and this is detailed enviro environmental data and crop management data and uh, genomic data and so forth, uh, they've got an incentive to clean that up as quickly as possible because they've got a limited window in which they can actually milk that data. And so we've been working with them to massively streamline that and uh, they've been really happy with that. So we're sitting in Minnesota being paid for by the Iowa Corn Growers Association to clean up data for the, for the US. Um, we've also uh, started to crack the nut on going beyond rhetoric and thinking about sharing public and private data. So we've, one of the other things when we looked around is we've got a lot of large, probably arguably the largest cluster of Fortune 500 food and ag companies sitting in around the Twin Cities. And our university had all tactical relationships with them where individual scientists would go and beg a bit of money and they do a little bit of research and so forth. And we, what we've been trying to shift towards is a much more strategic relationship. So Land Lakes, as many of you know, is a big farmer producer organisation in the Twin, Twin Cities, uh, has some big business units, Winfield uh, United, I think is now the largest supplier of agricultural inputs to farmers in the US. Um, they've got uh, Purina, uh, on animal feeds. Um, Sustain is another business unit looking at sort of uh, water, water quality and other attributes around uh, the, the economic, uh, the uh, ecological aspects of agriculture. And another company, Geosys, which does a lot of remote sensing analytics on, uh, on climate related data. So we've been working with them for some time and they are literally now starting to expose farmer level data to us at a field uh, farm county level uh, in our platform to start working with them and doing some uh, data analytics to support the, the sort of informatics that they're delivering to a farmer and then thinking about how you aggregate that up to a more landscape level and uh, that, that is, requires really tricky care around handling uh, 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 farmer generated data and working with uh, cooperative retailers and, and Land Lakes is a cooperative wholesaler. And so lots of institutional eggshells to walk through to make that happen. But at the end of the day, unless you have a tool that can, uh, uh, has a solid uh, uh, technical security on this data and it can guarantee legal privacy, uh, you might as well not start the conversation. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, I mentioned about the shifting location of agriculture. Uh, barley uh, production is under lots of market pressure now with the huge growth in microbreweries in the US. That's feeding directly down in the supply chain uh, to now uh, putting lots of pressure for more localised supply chains going into to those microbreweries, uh, which is now causing our barley breeder and his colleagues in about uh, six or seven other states to start thinking about uh, rejiggering their breeding programs so that they're now targeting uh, a set of you know protein and colour and, and other traits and also managing uh, biotic and abiotic resistance problems now constrained by these changing market realities, whereas before that wasn't... Uh, uh, something they had to deal with. And so we've been working with them to do a lot of market research to look at how, the, how that market's shifting and what that might mean with respect to sort of the pressures with respect to changing the environmental uh, uh, locations of their experimental trials across the upper Midwest and uh, the US more generally vis-a-vis -vis those localised markets that they're trying to, to target. And we're doing a bunch of work with the CGIR, so probably many people in the room here are engaged with them. So we're engaged with SEAT and CIMIT uh, directly and in conversations with a couple of other centres. We're engaged in the Excellence in Breeding Program. We're engaged in the CG Big Data uh, in Agriculture Program. Uh, and they, you know, they've got, uh, I've worked for that system for 20 years, so they've uh, got you know, mountains of numbers sitting out there uh, all over the place and trying to sort of herd that together and, and uh, get that data into usable space is tricky. Uh, and not unencumbered from the sorts of IP and privacy issues uh, for that system that I mentioned with respect to the private sector. Uh, we also have a, a pretty accomplished uh, group in uh, computer science and engineering. Uh, Vipin Kumar leads a lab uh, that's got a lot of prior art I've developed over the last 10 to 15 years in remote sensing in the life sciences applied to both health analytics but 
of late and uh, a lot of work done over in the, uh, uh, the food and ag space. And so we just scored a major NSF project uh, that comes online uh, uh, November 1 next month, uh, where we're <coughs> going to be doing, um, not from drones, but from satellites, uh, looking at issues uh, related to crop location detection and, and yield estimation uh, using uh, sort of next-gen deep learning uh, technologies that are now mashing up, I think it's eight uh, data from eight satellites that are coming at us with uh, different spectral and uh, temporal and spatial resolutions and uh, using some really interesting uh, analytic tools that Vipin's groups uh, developed and some more that uh, we're going to develop as a consequence of this. Uh, we've, uh, some of you may know the CropScape data that, the, that uh, uh, NAS put out, uh, which is, uh, uh, I don't know, 60 or 70 crops. It's an estimate of, a pixelated estimate of where in the US those crops are growing. Uh, and that graph, which you can't read there on the green and the, and the yellow, uh, is revealing massive type 1, type 2 errors in that data uh, as a consequence of us using much more refined uh, and, and multiple sets of data and uh, more advanced algorithms to sort of tease out uh, uh, the location of crops and so forth. Uh, uh, we also have a side piece of work because uh, we're engaging with the CG and the World Bank have signed on to this work with us to look at trying to do signal detection in much more complex, so you stick a corn plant uh, in uh, Africa, it's not trying the same as detecting a corn plant in a monoculture system uh, in the US. And so, uh, so we've got some access to some pretty uh, refined uh, ground truthing data that we're going to sort of adapt these uh, methodologies over into these polyculture systems. And, and another wrinkle on this is sort of looking at uh, mapping impervious water areas. So um, Minnesota has lots of concern about enough water, but an issue about water quality. Uh, uh, and uh, thinking about uh, runoffs from urban areas into, into rivers and lakes and the consequences for uh, just general well-being, but also in agriculture are substantial. And so another aspect of that project is in relation to that, although we're going to be proofing this up using some really uh, detailed data sets that the DC Water and Sewer Authority have, uh, have provided to us. And just to finalise, just to give you an example of how we're going beyond uh, sort of trait discovery and... Uh, and, and sort of science type applications using this platform to thinking out to, to deployment and stewardship. Uh, PepsiCo, uh, who may not be on many of your folks' radar as a food and ag company, but I look at these numbers for a living, and they came onto my radar about eight years ago. My estimates are they're about the fifth or sixth largest food and ag R&D company on the planet. So they own uh, Quaker Oats, they own Frito-Lay, uh, they own Tropicana Fruit Juice, uh, so they're not just a pop company. Um, and so they have a, 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 a large and very progressive agro uh, discovery group. Uh, and when we started engaging with them, I thought it was going to be mainly at the food end of the spectrum. And they are engaged with us at that end of the spectrum, but they're heavily engaged with us at the farm end of the spectrum. Um, so they have supported for many years, lots invested heavily in uh, oat genetics and potato genetics and lots of trial data all over the planet. And they have lots of data from a bunch of their uh, grower client, uh, um, clients and so forth. Um, and so they are now a major partner with us. They've relocated 11 full-time Pepsi scientists onto our campus. Their global director of crop improvement sits on our campus on a day-to-day -day basis. They relocated their uh, head of, uh, global head of computational biology from White Plains, New York to, to uh, Minnesota. And he and a colleague sit in the same group physical space uh, with the rest of our GEMS team. Uh, and we've been learning a hell of a lot from them. Uh, and they've... Uh, actually committed, we're in the process of uh, ingesting uh, all of their global agro discovery data into this platform, uh, which is a really tricky job. So although we think we've put a lot of effort into this data security, we're now going through this mind-numbing audit with their um, IT folks and their uh, lawyers to, 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 to assure them that uh, we can perform uh, to the standard we say we're performing. Uh, and so it takes a lot of sort of institutional innovation and effort to actually go beyond the rhetoric of public-private partnerships and actually put them into practice. But what we're doing is going beyond asking them for money to thinking about a research engagement and using smart data sharing tools to, fa to facilitate that engagement where we sh we've got joint research going on with their scientists, they're sharing data, and they're also putting some re financial resources in as we are. So it's a very different way of thinking about public-private partnerships and just pay-for-service type thing, and we're putting a lot of effort on thinking where the pre-commercialisation line begins and ends, and some work we do for them, which is just pure fee-for-service work, and we're very clear about that, and we charge them full cost, 
But amazingly, a lot of their work is in this pre-commercialization space, uh, and we've been uh, learning a lot by engaging with them. So uh, just take one of their, uh, so, so for them, uh, Oats is a two and a half, three billion dollar business, but it's rounding error for the USDA. There's not much research going on in the USDA or the land grants on oat research. Um, so they first of all wanted to understand uh, the changing location of uh, production of oats, which we've done that work and presented that to them. Uh, and uh, trust me, where oats has grown on the planet shifted big time. Um, and so for them, here's the sort of problem that they think through. It's, it's, so the technology is at the heart of it, but it's not the only thing they think through with respect to strategic, strategic investments in innovations in oat production. So it turns out uh, they own the largest small grain mill in the US, and it's based in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And when they built that, there was lots of oats growing around that, uh, that uh, mill. And now a lot of their oats are growing up here in Canada and up in uh, northern Minnesota and bits over into Dakota. Uh, but they also source from other parts of the planet as well. So they've got this big decision to make. So do they, ex uh, do they keep expanding that plant in Cedar Rapids, Iowa? Or do they try and change the incentives for farmers to grow oats and move the oats back in uh, to the upper Midwest? Um, uh, or a bit of both? Uh, and so that's, and when they start moving those oats, they're going to expose those oats to different pressures with respect to, say, crown rust. Uh, and then when they look at a field of oats, they, don't, they look at its beta-glucan production. And so they know something about G by E by M relationships that, that change the odds of uh, a beta-glucan expression. Uh, and so they have a shared interest with their arch-rival General Mills, who's also based in the Twin Cities, with respect to solving, say, the crown rust problem. And they're sharing data and enabling partnerships with millers up here in Canada, Australia, the US, General Mills, to solve that problem. But they're keeping other parts of their data proprietary, and we're helping work with them on that with respect to thinking about modelling G by E by M influ influences on, on oat quality. And so that's the complex set of things that they're worried about. And the reason they're worried about it, if I remember the, the, the statistics right, when they're moving oats down from Canada and the upper Midwest to that mill, a few years ago, all of their, their uh, railroad traffic got sidelined because of fracking oil out of Dakotas, and that mill uh, 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 they want to retain a 30-day buffer of grain in that mill, and they got down to two days. If that mill shuts, it's a million dollars a day consequence for them. <laughs> so they, they, they are thinking strategically about knowing how long it takes to invest in uh, new varieties and deploy them out in the field that incentivise farmers. So they've got a tough problem. They've got to incentivise far farmers uh, to get out of corn and soybeans and in some niche areas uh, perhaps grow oats and so forth. And so. We're working with them to think through both the, the technology implications of that, but within this sort of market context. Um, and they're also, like everyone else, uh, trying to adhere to sus more sustainable production practices, and so we're actually doing a lot of work with them about thinking about uh, nitrogen runoff consequences with respect to, to oat production. Um, and they also have a lot of analytics they do to support uh, farmers. Uh, they've actually developed this really cool tool called uh, OptiOat. Uh, which tries to optimise sort of management strategies given local agroecologies. But in the past, their, their farmer level data was sitting totally disparate from their genomics data and it was sitting totally disparate from their... So their genomics data is heavily developed in the US and we actually do a lot of the sequencing for that data. Uh, a lot of their agronomic work is led out of uh, a colleague of, uh, um, in, based in Cambridge in the UK and this platform is actually making that data all come together. They also, their view when I talk to them over the beers is that this is going to accelerate their, their partnership uh, processes by at least 18 months to two years and they think they're going to get a competitive advantage out of that because you can, they can reveal metadata without giving away data to try and incentivise people to come to them and say, hey, we're working on a, in this space, maybe we should team up uh, and they can partner and move forward in that, that regard. Uh, really tough to get good people in this space who have dual domain expertise in biological sciences and, and uh, high performance computing. Uh, luckily, we, about 10 years ago, formed this uh, effort called BICBI, uh, which has got about 100 faculty from across the life sciences, both in health and ag, and in uh, our uh, computer sciences space. And it's a, it's a very tailored program. So if a student comes in with a lot of biology and very little data science, they're given a heavy dose of data science, and if they come in reverse, uh, likewise. And so uh, this has become a really popular program, and we've got some really great uh, partners, uh, both public and private, uh, helping us scale up. Uh, I think uh, Morris mentioned that uh, uh, this effort here is starting to catalyse lots of uh, uh, cross-disciplinary efforts and we've found in the last 80 months uh, to two years this GEMS platform has opened up all sorts of partnerships across campus uh, 
uh, through data pooling and by making this data interoperable uh, beyond rhetoric to, to reality, there's lots of opportunities for new partnerships. We're getting written into lots of grants. A bunch of them are now getting funded. Uh, and so it's uh, given a, a great uh, uh, impetus to, to new collaboration efforts, both within the campus and globally. We formed this uh, uh, International Agroinformatics Alliance three years ago. Uh, we had a meeting in May. It's our third. Uh, we had about 60 partners, and we've signed on partners in the UK, uh, Brazil, Australia, and a few in the US. Um, and open to partnership here in Canada. Uh, and it's a, a vehicle by which we bring people together to help sort of uh, steer the sort of collective effort around the core development of the, of, uh, the platform uh, with the idea that we're always demand driven. We're not off building this thing in isolation. Every element we do is driven by a practical uh, application. Uh, so we finally have a website. And if you want to go and look what we're doing, uh, there it is, agroinformatics.org. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks.